I got three takeaway messages from the first rule, second chapter, of Jordan B. Peterson's 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos. They were, one, be the mightiest lobster. Two, bullies will only bully you if you let them. And three, to fake strength in order to get strength. There was a lot of what for me in reading this chapter, so put on your favorite crawdad socks for lobsters if you got them. And let's just get into this. Welcome back to the channel and especially welcome back if you are here from the overture video last week. It's been crazy. It's been great. So welcome everybody. And if you're returning, hi. <laughs> if you're new, hi. Uh, this week we are starting with rule one of Jordan B. Peterson's 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos. And this rule is to stand up straight with your shoulders back and this chapter actually has references, which I am absolutely going to be diving into and tearing into when it's interesting. I think I said my piece about my personal feelings towards Dr. Peterson in the last video, so won't be rehashing that here. If this is the first video of mine you're catching, here's a short of it, and I am quite short. I have a cognitive psychology PhD, and I have issues with the Freudian and Jungian approaches to psychology. Dr. Peterson is a counseling psychologist who, at the very least, has taken strong influences from Jung in his work. To clarify, cognitive psychology is not one of the varieties of counseling. Uh, counseling psychologists are largely interested in helping people with either day-to-day -day problems, marriage problems, or more difficult problems like you would find in the psychological disorders. In cognitive, we're interested basically in how people think, how you learn information, how you remember information, what your attention does during different tasks, um, language processing, decision making, you know, how you think. And that's what we're interested in. And we do sometimes apply it to things like driving, but for the most part, we're off in our own little world studying this stuff, not helping people. Like we have zero training in helping people. So I just wanna make sure that's clear, especially as we go through this. Also, if this is your first video, uh, I'll have the main Peterson flow of ideas shot this way mm -hmm. and points where I interrupt that to give commentary or interpretation. In order to keep this mostly on track and on time, I'm not going to go through every single reference that he cites. Uh, like, I'm willing to take him at his word that reference three talks about the pecking order of chickens, and that's what it talks about. There are references I will be digging into, and oh boy, there is, there is some stuff there. So, we're picking on the ones that are problematic, let's say. Alright, let's try to keep this short for once in my life, maybe script is suggesting otherwise, but let's try. So without further ado, let's get into rule one. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. So I wasn't wrong last week about lobster being the first word in this chapter, but I didn't realize that what I saw as lobster was actually like a section heading. So first section is lobsters and territory. So I wasn't wrong, but I'm not necessarily right there either. We start this section by talking about the lobsters. Lobsters live in the ocean and they need to seek out good food sources and good places to live. After introducing the lobsters, Peterson asks what happens when there are hundreds of lobsters all trying to make a living and raise a family in the same small area. Pedantic alert. I had to look this up because I had to know if lobsters have families. Not in a social mom and dad with the kids kind of way. I mean, so the lady, 
lobster will hook up the male lobster. She'll go back to his place. She'll molt, because that's the only time that she's able to be mated with. And then he will put his special present in her sperm receptacle. And then she hangs around until she's hard again. And then she goes back to her place, lays her eggs some point in the next year and a half. And that's the last she'll ever see of her babies again. Okay, fine. He was being cute, but he already threw in the dad joke of feeling crabby, so I had to check. He notes other things, like wrens, which are happy little chirpy birds, have problems like this too. And his description of a wren is a brilliantly musical bird that's a small warrior proclaiming his sovereignty. Warrior? Warrior? In Jungian psychology, the warrior goes on the hero's path, fights the dragon archetype, which is a representation of his mom, to gain independence from his parents. Warrior. Why else would he call a happy little chirpy bird a warrior? Who's Pepe Sylvia? Peterson shares a story of when he was a kid and he and his dad built bird boxes. And his bird box was nice. I think it was like a covered log wagon sort of thing with a little hole so the bird could get in, but not like ravens or something. And they also made their neighbor one, which was an old boot with a hole cut in it. <laughs> and so a wren moved into Peterson's family box and this wren filled the boot full of sticks, so it would just not be usable by any other bird. Despite the neighbor's displeasure about the boot situation, Peterson's dad was basically like, there's nothing we can do. We can empty out the sticks. The bird's just going to put the sticks in again. It doesn't want that occupied. Just leave it be. Around this time, Peterson got some money from his school because his school had an insurance policy designed to reward unfortunate clumsy children, and he had broken his leg skiing. What bougie fantasy world did he grow up in? Where I'm from, if there was like an insurance policy for kids through the school, there would have been just kids throwing themselves in front of buses, running themselves over with cars, like there would have been insurance fraud to an unprecedented degree. He used this money to buy a tape recorder. And I guess if you don't know what that is because you're young enough, uh, you know the app on your phone where you can record sounds? It's like that, except like big and kind of cumbersome. And there were tapes, like media things that you had to put in to record on. And, and there you go. He bought one. At his dad's suggestion, he recorded this friend's bird song and then played it back for him. And this move was not well received by the bird. Then Peterson discusses the key differences between wrens and lobsters, like wrens can't breathe underwater and lobsters can't fly. But he does note that both are obsessed with status and position. I see what he's doing. By calling out the differences between these two very different animals, the similarity between them becomes so much more impactful. I thought we were done with animals, but now we're talking about chickens and their pecking order. And so Peterson describes the chicken hierarchy from the alpha cocks to the bedraggled, partially feathered, and badly pecked wretches who occupy the lowest untouchable stratum of the chicken hierarchy. We're coming back to the chicken hierarchy in a sec, so like, don't forget chicken pyramid. It'll come back. Chickens, like suburbanites, live communally. Do we though? One of my professors in grad school legitimately lived in a commune, or at least as much of a commune as you can get in a city. And it was this nice little organized cluster of houses and it was organized and they had like a central money pool for things. They had a central house that people could use and throw parties at and stuff. 
and it had a huge kitchen for entertaining. I guess the kitchens in the houses that they lived in weren't as big. So if you're throwing a party, that's where you went. And this professor did throw a party once because she landed a huge grant. And so we got to see it. And it was a little bit weird because other people from the commune and their kids just kept dropping in and, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, it's great. Blah, 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 blah. There was a strong United hippie vibe in this whole thing. Um, I mean, one, they call it a commune. So there's that. And two, it really seemed like everybody involved with this did things for the greater good. All about the greater good. The greater good. I've never experienced anything like that before then or since then. And I think I'm okay with that. I'm really bad at sharing. Maybe he's meaning the meaning of to deal with the community. But if that's the case, then the happy little chirpy birds are in a community. It's just much less close-knit and affiliated as the chickens in their pecking order. Moving on, lest I disappear up my own butt. As if by magic, to counter my last point, Peterson argues that wrens don't live in a community, they just have a dominance hierarchy. Okay, we're going to have to agree to disagree on this one, I guess. The stronger, healthier birds have better territories that they have fought for and have won. And these better territories grant them better food access, better shelter, better mate selection, and presumably better offspring. Okay, sure, but I would greatly appreciate the reference for the less stressed existence that some of these birds are living. And could you operationalize stress for this, please? Side thought, that'll come back, I promise. One thing you have to be careful with, especially in psychology, is some of the experiments that are done seem like they'd be common sense, and so... Cognitive psychologists can get a lot of side-eye from people because, well, of course that's the result that you got. Everybody knew that that's how this memory thing worked, or attention did this, or whatever. Duh, we knew that. Why are you wasting taxpayer money doing this? Blah, blah, blah. And sometimes experiments go exactly how you would expect. An example is memory. The more time has passed, the more things you'll have forgotten. Seems fairly straightforward and duh, but we have data to back this up. Other things are surprising. An example of that is people are more likely to find something credible as a source if they're shown a picture of a brain. Just slap a picture of a brain on a news article and people are more likely to believe whatever's in it. Did you expect that? Certainly I didn't, but... It's a thing. It's been demonstrated a couple times. Crazy. The point of this tangent, somehow, is basically complaining about Peterson's really sporadic referencing. The last reference we got was about the chicken pecking order, and the next reference is about birds getting the bird flu, like community flu, even though the article that he's referencing for that says nothing about birds or birds getting sick. Nothing. So we're talking about bird stress, and there's no reference in sight about birds, stress, bird stress, nothing. And this, this is just driving me crazy. He argues that there is little difference between territorial rights and social status. Kinda, sure. But I think lumping them together you end up losing the nuances of the difference between social species and asocial species. That's a whole other rabbit hole, literally, to go down, but I'm trying to stay on track here. So, what does any of this have to do with life being hard and getting your shit together? Citation Police, on page 4, he drops a reference for a paper on social status and health, and it's actually reference 4. Peterson uses this citation in the context of explaining how a bird flu going through an area will hit the lower status birds first, or at least the hardest. In context with where the reference was placed, it made it seem like that's what this article was talking about, but nope. 
This article, while very informative about mammals and how they get sick and how they respond to stress, it said nothing about birds, it said nothing about bird flus, and it said nothing about birds getting sick from the flu. Granted, this reference plays somewhat better as support for lower SES people being harder hit by diseases and illnesses, but if that's the case, stick it down there, Dr. P. Don't stick it where it doesn't belong. The point about talking about all these animals competing for territory is that this competition is a form of conflict. Yes, we're back to conflict again. And he says that this conflict is something to be avoided if possible. And I don't disagree with him here. Like animals fighting, especially if it comes to butting heads or fighting it out, there is a potential cost, even for the winner, of engaging in fighting like that. So if possible, it should be avoided. In this section, Peterson describes the lobster battles for top crustacean status. Lobsters, along with many other animals, over the centuries, millennia, whatever, have learned that it's better to avoid a fight than to be in one. And so Peterson spends a fair bit of time talking about the sort of rules of engagement between lobsters in the escalation of hostilities. If the fight does go full-blown, level four, whatever, hostilities where the lobsters are physically attacking each other, eventually you'll have a winning lobster and a losing lobster. And here comes a huge wall of text from Peterson because I think it is just quintessentially him. In the aftermath of a losing battle, regardless of how aggressively a lobster has behaved, it becomes unwilling to fight further, even against another previously defeated opponent. A vanquished competitor loses confidence, sometimes for days. Sometimes the defeat can have even more severe consequences. If a dominant lobster is badly defeated, its brain basically dissolves. Then it grows a new subordinate's brain, one more appropriate to its new lowly position. Its original brain just isn't sophisticated enough to manage the transformation from king to bottom dog without virtually complete dissolution and regrowth. Anyone who has experienced a painful transformation after a serious defeat in romance or career may feel some sense of kinship with the once successful crustacean. One citation for a whole lot of statements of fact. Well, let's look at reference 8. Side note, I am getting incredibly lucky on finding the PDFs for these things online. Where's my lobster? I'll hail the lobster queen. Long may she reign. First point is a pedantic taxonomic point. Lobsters are not crayfish. They're separate things. This paper is talking about injecting crayfish with serotonin, causing them to take that elevated aggressive posture that he goes on and on about. The quick version is, I don't know where Peterson got some of the ideas he talks about because it sure as shit isn't in this paper. Buckle in for the long version. Can we talk about lobster confidence for a second? Cool. Thanks. So this is something I'm incredibly guilty of, and maybe that's why it's easier for me to spot. But when you're doing scientific writing, don't personify stuff. We don't know why that lobster doesn't want to fight anymore. To say it's because it lost its confidence is kind of silly. To say it's because of a loss of confidence, first we have to demonstrate that lobsters have confidence, that they can lose this confidence, and that they can lose this confidence after fighting. That would require references, and they're not here. Maybe this could be hand-waved as the posturing that they're doing as a proxy for confidence, but Peterson doesn't do that, and the references included don't do that. How badly is badly defeated? A loss? Just a loss or a loss of body parts? Don't be vague. After reading, its brain basically dissolves. I came into this paper expecting some like magical butterfly transformation here. Like, crustaceans aren't really far removed from like other creepy crawlies, so maybe it's able to somehow just dissolve its brain? 
This paper says nothing about brains dissolving. This paper says nothing about brains dissolving. This paper does talk about neuronal regulation of different types of receptors as a result of experience, but not brains dissolving. Yes, this paper does talk about the dominant crayfish having a different response to serotonin than the submissive crayfish, but not brains dissolving. Something else this paper talks about will be relevant later. So in addition to the chicken pyramid, I need you to remember lobster mortality rates. This section begins with a discussion of reference nine. You only know this if you actually have reference nine in front of you because Peterson's reference placement is practically random. Anyways, basically, lobster doms have more serotonin pumping through them. From reference eight, you win, you get a higher level of serotonin. If you're a submissive lobster, you have a higher ratio of octopamine to serotonin. But if you give lobster subs more serotonin, they start acting dommy. Then if you give lobsters Prozac, the effects of the serotonin shot are reduced. So in this experiment, giving the lobsters Prozac kept the serotonin out in the goo, basically, and not in the tissues. And why the fuck is Peterson talking about this? He says that Prozac has much the same chemical and behavioral effect in depressed people. Is Prozac a performance enhancing drug? I hadn't realized. Is that on their warnings for the drug commercial? Finally, he says, in one of the more staggering demonstrations of the evolutionary continuity of life on Earth, Prozac even cheers up lobsters. Cute sentiment, Peterson, but that's not what this reference is about. Reference 10 is talking about squat lobsters. <laughs> and how they're different from other lobsters and crayfish. Squat lobsters still have the sort of aggressive dominant response to serotonin and the submissive response to octopamine, but left to their own devices, they don't really have dominance hierarchies. Nothing here about cheering up lobsters. Anyways, winning lobsters have higher levels of serotonin and lower levels of octopamine, and losing lobsters have low levels of serotonin and higher levels of octopamine. Higher levels of octopamine are associated with an easier startle reflex, among other things. And then he petersons it up by saying, You can see an echo of that in the heightened startle reflex characteristic of the soldier or battered child with post-traumatic stress disorder. I just... Why? Why? Peterson? No. Why? Topic for another day, but what the fuck does this have to do with lobsters? I'm getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. This section begins by talking about lobsters who win going on to win more and lobsters who lose going on to lose more. There's no reference for this. The lobster and the crawfish papers haven't talked about this, and the next reference is for wealth imbalances in humans. I need citations for this. Peterson, come on. I'm gonna have a rage chasm over here. Following Peterson in his flow of consciousness writing style, now we're talking about Price's Law and similar concepts. Price's square root law indicates that in the sciences, about half of a set of publications is coming from a disproportionate square root of authors. 
And now, in addition to the citation police, we have the appropriate source handling sheriffs or something. This metaphor stops now. In looking up and verifying the price law, I end up on the Wikipedia page, as you do. And then my plagiarism sense started tingling. The Wikipedia reads, it can be modeled using a approximately L-shaped graph with number of people on the y-axis and productivity or resources on the x-axis. Peterson's description now. It can be modeled using an approximately L-shaped graph with number of people on the vertical axis and productivity or resources on the horizontal. So not only does the poor underpaid adjunct have their red pen of angry grading out, they've got their plagiarism highlighter out too. Dr. Peterson. No. Changing the spelling to Canadian, fixing a typo, and changing what you're calling the axis is not paraphrasing. You should know better. No. Shame. Shame. Naturally, one of the concepts we talk about is biblical in nature. This one is the Matthew principle, which comes from one of Jesus' sayings that was written in Matthew. Basically, those who have get more and those who do not have, get less. And that's about all we're going to say about it because Peterson moves on like a dog who just saw a squirrel. So most lobsters and crayfish have stable dominance hierarchies. And it sounds kind of like it works like the orcs in Shadow of Mordor, where you have like the top orc and if they get knocked off, then you get the fighting and somebody else takes the place. Lobsters do the same thing. Probably without assassinations and fire and elves and all that, but anyways. A final quote from this section because what am I even doing with this series if I don't include this quote? The top lobster parades his dominance around his territory, rousting subordinate lobsters from their shelters at night just to remind them who's their daddy. Lobster daddy indeed. Enough about the lobster bros, now let's talk about the lobster ladies. So, according to Peterson, females, lobsters or humans, identify the top guy pretty quickly and become irresistibly attracted to him. I'ma let him finish before I say what I think, cause believe it or not, it gets worse. Instead of undertaking the computationally difficult task of identifying the best man, the females outsource the problem to the machine-like calculations of the dominance hierarchy. They let the males fight it out and peel their paramours from the top. It's more complicated than that. Talking about mate selection is never black and white. I mean, maybe it is for things that asexually reproduce instead of doing the sex, but except for things like yeast and other such, my point still stands. You have a species where you have a dominant male that you think is siring all of these children. Do a paternity test. Seriously. This has been demonstrated in some types of birds, in cuttlefish, elephant seals, I think gorillas, basically just a bunch of different species. You run that paternity test on those kids that should have been born to that dominant male. And what you'll find is a good majority of them are, but some are born to the submissive males in the area. Big Lobster Daddy has to sleep sometimes. He has to eat sometimes. And when he does, sexy shenanigans happen. Human mate selection is not straightforward. And this book, male, female, is on my to-do list of things to go through because it explores basically the sex differences between males and females. And this includes mate selection. Bottom line, there's a ton of factors that go into mate selection. It's not just, ooh, he's a big strong guy. I have to make babies with him. For fuck's sake. Okay, so Lobster Stacy moves in with Lobster Chad, at least for a little bit, so she can molt and receive the spunk nugget. Peterson says that she does this because he's the top lobster, but why? Yeah, yeah, strong offspring and all of that, but there's more to it than that. The female lobsters go with the male dominant lobster 
because they need to know that they're not going to be disturbed when they're in this incredibly vulnerable state. It's a safety issue. It's not just big strong genes for my big strong babies. It isn't power for power's sake. There's a reason this is attractive to lobsters. Moving on. The dominant male, with his upright and confident posture, not only gets the prime real estate and easiest access to the best hunting grounds, he also gets all the girls. It is exponentially more worthwhile to be successful if you are a lobster and male. First, sexy shenanigans. Lobster Chad isn't always the baby daddy. Trust. Go on, Maury. Second, we're coming back to the lobster mortality rates. So... Reference 8 had this almost as an aside, where it talked about the mortality rates of lobsters when put into new pairings. So you've got the lobsters who were submissive and then got a shot to be dominant. You had the dominant lobsters who got a shot to be submissive. And then you've got the lobsters who were never messed with. And what you find is when these guys are put in new pairings, the lobsters who were submissive and were always submissive had the highest survival rates. The lobsters who got messed with were dying at a higher rate. So maybe a lobster is submissive for reasons other than its confidence. Finally, what an empty statement. It's worthwhile to be successful? I mean, isn't that the definition of success? You're killing me, bruh. Peterson wraps up the section by telling us why we've been talking about lobsters in the first place. It's because they're older than dirt and they have dominance hierarchies. Seriously. Dominance hierarchies have been an essential permanent feature of the environment to which all complex life has adapted. Just because things have dominance hierarchies doesn't mean that isn't something that we could change since we live in a society. Is a behavioral thing that happens really a feature of the environment? I've gone back and forth on this, and I honestly don't know. So if there's any evolutionary biologists who happen to be watching this, do share. Let's talk evolution. Evolution laid down the cornerstones for basic physiology long ago. Pedantic, again with the personification, evolution didn't do shit. Animals mated with each other for reasons, the environment may have been harsher on some for reasons, but evolution didn't do anything. So, beyond that, I don't really have any issues with Peterson's description of evolution. I mean, if anything, yay! Pushing evolution as a valid explanation for things and not feeling the need to talk about other things. Thank you so much. But could you do it maybe in a more succinct and less flowery and vague way? Thanks. Until then, I'm going to give you the version that I go with. Okay, so the quick rundown in case you need to brush up on evolution or you live in an area where it's not really taught in schools. Sorry. Uh, Timestamp somewhere if you are good on evolution though. Otherwise, here we go. One, organisms are complex. The theory of evolution tries to answer how they got this way. Two, Darwin used natural laws to explain instead of supernatural forces. And this was pretty revolutionary at the time, so go Darwin. Three, main mechanism of evolution is natural selection. Four, assumptions of natural selection. First, Rapid reproduction equals rapid population growth. You got a bunch of bunnies making little bunnies, you're going to have a lot of bunnies. If you have a bunch of elephants trying to make more elephants, it's going to go slower. That's it. Second, resources don't grow with the population. Just because there's more baby bunnies running around doesn't mean there's going to be more carrots. Third, as a consequence of the first and second points, competition between members of the same species for resources. You got those little baby bunnies trying to compete for all those little baby carrots, and not all the bunnies are going to get carrots. Fourth, variation between individuals in characteristics. 
We're talking variations within a species on ecologically relevant or important characteristics. So in some areas, fur color might not matter. In other areas, fur color might be incredibly important. Eye color might not matter. Eye color might matter. You know, it, it depends on what your situation is. Fifth assumption is that some variations are genetic or heritable. If these variations weren't able to be passed on to your offspring, it was just a one-off with you, it's not helpful. It's not going to help the offspring. It's not going to be something that can be selected for or against. Five. So, reproductive success depends on, at least in part, ecologically important heritable traits. That is natural selection. Reproductive success means being able to live long enough to pass on your genes successfully. So, as of recording, I am still alive, but I have no kids. So, my reproductive fitness is zero. Even though I'm not dead yet, I don't have any kids. Six. Evolution, then, is the change in characteristics over time. Adaptive evolution is the change in ecologically meaningful characteristics over time to better fit organisms to their environment. Then, if I was covering this in intro psych, I would talk about evidence supporting evolution before moving on to talk about evolutionary psychology, but those are topics for another day. Peterson has some questions about all of this. What exactly is the nature in natural selection? What exactly is the environment to which animals adapt? This is pretty rich coming from Captain Vague. There is a paragraph I have reread several times trying to be able to make sense of it, let alone make a coherent gist of it for this video. Here's the best I got. So he talks about nature being assumed to be a static thing, especially in natural selection, but that's wrong. And then there's this whole yin-yang component that you can think of nature in, but really it's about the masculine versus feminine, but really, really it's about order versus chaos. And hey, nature varies a lot, like music. That's why music is really interesting to us. And I tried. I tried. That's the best I've got. I just... Moving on. There's a whole lot a vague flowery language about nature being something that isn't static and how evolution isn't trying to push every organism to its ultimate final form. Reading this, I was mildly annoyed at how much he was just belaboring this point of evolution, but then it clicked. I'm not the target audience. He's having to write this with the assumption that People might not really be that familiar with evolution, so leave it be. But nature isn't strictly dynamic either, and there's nested order in chaos and order in chaos. And trees? <sighs> then he says we need to not romanticize nature, as we city folk do tend to do about the great outdoors and how wonderful and idyllic it is. It's not. It's all just chaos. Just chaos. If Mother Nature wasn't so hell-bent on our destruction, it would be easier for us to exist in simple harmony with her dictates. To paraphrase my favorite anime movie, uniformity and stagnation are death. We need to be kept on our toes. We need to keep our edge. We need to be challenged in order for us as individuals to stay sharp, as well as species. If life wasn't hard and Mother Nature wasn't trying to kill us, we'd get complacent, and the next disease mutation that comes along could easily wipe out a species if there's not variation due to challenges that they've faced. On a personal level, if you're not challenged, life really can become that nihilistic death march he's so afraid of. Remember back to the beginning of the Overture video, where I was talking about the cosmic horror being basically an understanding of our place in the universe? Mother Nature isn't trying to kill us or destroy us. Mother Nature doesn't give a flying fuck about us. And then the brain worms consume him. 
The order within the chaos and order of being is all the more natural the longer it has lasted. This is because nature is what selects, and the longer a feature has existed, the more time it has had to be selected and to shape life. The dominance hierarchy is permanent because it's been around for a very long time. And don't you dare confuse the dominance hierarchy with the patriarchy. Totally not the same thing. At all. This argument confuses me. Prior to this, Peterson has been very much man against nature, order against chaos, blah, blah. But then dominance hierarchies are just part of nature, so we just gotta deal with it? Dom's gonna dom? Why'd he flip? Maybe because it's convenient and lets him argue this point with an appeal to nature and time. But who can say? The part of our brain that keeps track of our position in the dominance hierarchy is therefore exceptionally ancient and fundamental. It is a master control system, modulating our perception, values, emotions, thoughts, and actions. It powerfully affects every aspect of our being, conscious and unconscious alike. Which brain part, Peterson? I mean, talking about it like a master control system and everything makes me think thalamus, but... You didn't say that. A quick Google search kind of hints that maybe it's the thalamus you're talking about here, but why not just say it? Reference 17 is a book chapter that reviews the research on serotonin and its role in processing social dominance hierarchy stuff. Peterson goes on to talk about our posture when we're defeated, how if things don't improve, we can become chronically depressed, and if things get really bad, we can open up ourselves as targets for bullies. He then brings back loser lobsters to talk about how they produce less serotonin, as do low-ranking humans. He then talks about low serotonin as a cause for decreased happiness, lower confidence, increased illness, increased anxiety, and a shorter lifespan. Correlation is not causation. This is something I beat into my intro psych students. Correlation is not causation. I won't argue with the findings he's talking about here because it has been borne out by the research, but I urge caution when you're thinking about the relationship between these lower serotonin levels and the findings he's talking about. There could be other factors at play here driving that relationship. So, if you don't want those things, you just need to get higher serotonin, which is from a higher spot on the dominance hierarchy. Peterson starts this section by talking about a primordial calculator, which keeps track of your social rank. If I wanted to be sadistic, I would suggest a drinking game for every time I complain about a reference. But I won't. But there isn't a reference here. Maybe he's talking about reference 17 again, and so I've read it and reread it, looking for like brain areas or networks or anything that would keep track of your rank on your dominance hierarchy, and it's not there. The findings they talk about are things like serotonin being associated with the higher ranks, which we've talked about, lower levels of serotonin, people have that, they're more likely to interpret a neutral face as angry or threatening, uh, deeper voiced people, men, tend to do well in business, tend to be CEOs, and people with deeper voices also tend to be rated higher in the looks department. Basically, the effects of serotonin aren't always more DACA. The reference at the end of this paragraph, 18, is a comparative analysis of mate selection between species. So nothing there to support this primordial rank calculator. Give me a reference for this, Peterson, come on. Anyways, males and females compete for social dominance in different ways because reasons. I'm not disputing this point. If anything, the dimorphism between males and females in our species is interesting because it hints at what mate selective practices were going on in our history. But that's a topic for another day. 
Oh my God, this video is gonna be so long. Moving on. Peterson talks about the differences in the West today. Basically, he doesn't use those words. Due to socioeconomic status or SES for short. Socioeconomic status is an umbrella term that tries to encapsulate differences in social rank based on wealth, education level, job, where you live, a lot of different factors that all sort of make up basically your class in society. Up, upper class, upper middle class, middle class, lower middle class, and lower class. Working class. As per reference 19, people in the lower SES are more likely to die from things like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, stroke, you know, the bad things that you can die from. But then he Petersons it up by saying, you are more likely to fall ill, age rapidly, and die young with few, if any, to mourn you. Jesus Christ, Peterson. For one, I saw nothing about funeral attendance rates in any of these sources. Two, that's the same sort of shit that somebody who is very manipulative and abusive would say to somebody else. Come on. Then he says that money won't help lower status people because they won't know how to use it because it's difficult to use money properly, particularly if you're unfamiliar with it. Money will make you liable to the dangerous temptations of drugs and alcohol. Money will also make you a target for predators and psychopaths who thrive on exploiting those who exist on the lower rungs of society. Surface level, yes. Money literacy is something that frequently has to be taught regardless of status. Recreational drugs do cost money and mo money, mo problems. But people from the lower SES groups are sometimes able to work their butts off and make it into the higher SES groups. It's not all doom and damnation for them. And if there were more references here from Peterson supporting what he's arguing, I'd have an easier time buying it, but they're not here. And so basically this just reads as incredibly classist and kind of condescending. The ancient part of your brain specialized for assessing dominance watches how you're treated by other people. On that evidence, it renders a determination of your value and assigns you a status. If you are judged by your peers as of little worth, the counter restricts serotonin availability. Not a reference in sight. I'm guessing he's talking about reference 17 again, the book chapter. And the book chapter talks about vervet monkeys who, once dominant, then they lose their status and they have lower serotonin after. That's the closest I can figure out. As far as I can tell, he hasn't referenced anything about this brain region or network that's supposed to support this primordial rank calculator. Like, maybe I missed it, but I don't think I did. A little bit of a side note. The reference 17, the book chapter, talks about having lower serotonin levels as being protective, since it actually might keep you from picking fights that you can't win. Peterson continues by talking about physiological and psychological stress and how it can wear down the body and like its immune system and stuff. He then says that lower SES people have to be hypervigilant and hyperreactive to threats, and this has a greater toll on the body. So yes to stress and its effect on the body, less so yes, maybe more on the no for his cause of the problem here. I'm sure the vigilance and reactivity is part of it, but that's not all of it. Lower SES people frequently have to work multiple jobs, and so they're working themselves into an early grave. Lower SES people typically have poor health care. That'll cost you in longevity. Lower SES people typically have a poorer diet, and that's going to cost you. I could go on. There's a ton of factors here beyond just their stress level that could contribute to their differences in disease and death rates. Correlation is not causation. 
The ancient counter will render you impulsive so that you will jump, for example, at any short-term mating opportunities or any possibilities of pleasure, no matter how subpar, disgraceful, or illegal. So about reference 20. In this, undergrads are tested in the ultimatum game. In the ultimatum game, you have a person who's making a deal and a person who has to decide whether or not they want to take that deal. And you're splitting up money. So the person making the deal gets to set, you get 40%, I take 60, you get 20%, I take 80, whatever. And the person gets to decide, yeah, I'll take that deal, or no, I won't take that deal. If they don't take the deal, nobody gets money. So it's sort of punishing the deal maker. In general, in the research, people tend to reject deals where they get less than 30%. Reference 20 had undergrads go through this game after being dosed with either a placebo or something that lowered their serotonin levels just briefly, and the deals that they were offered ranged from fair to very unfair. They found that participants were more likely to reject these unfair deals if they had lower serotonin levels, and these rejections couldn't be accounted for in terms of like mood or increased or decreased impulsivity. So that's reference 20. So not only does this article say nothing about mating behaviors in humans or anything, Peterson also seems to have gotten it ass backwards. Back to the high status people, Peterson says that their serotonin flows plentifully and life is good. They can afford to delay gratification because they know they'll have opportunities for it again. And he also says that they can afford to be a reliable and thoughtful citizen. What, lower status people can't? We'll leave it. We'll leave it there. Peterson says that the status tracker can be messed with by not getting enough sleep, or not having a good sleep schedule, or not eating breakfast. Yes, routine is important. I know for like bipolar disorder, it's important to keep your sleep schedule very regular, but of course, as always, references are sparse. Other bad habits can interfere with the status tracker. Much of the time, when destructive positive feedback loops happen, we label it mental illness, even though it's not only or even at all occurring inside people's psyches. After this, he talks about alcoholics becoming alcoholics and agoraphobics developing their fear of leaving their house. So I assume his issue with the mental illness thing is sort of, he just wants acknowledgement about the body's role in all of this. Yes, the body is an important part of this discussion of mental health or mental illness, and it does interact with the brain on these things. But what makes one person a responsible drinker and another an alcoholic? At one point, he does acknowledge the genetic predisposition that some people might have towards addictive behaviors, but then he never talks about it again. And it's really something that's so important here to talk about, about addictive behaviors or mood disorders, any psych disorders, like the genetic predisposition is something that can't be ignored, just like the body can't be ignored. He argues that trauma can change the dominance or status tracker in a way that makes future bad things more likely. And he references bullying as an example here and a book that just, I'm not going to get my hands on in time. He says that people who are bullied as kids become anxious and easily upset. They shield themselves with a defensive crouch and avoid the direct eye contact interpretable as a dominance challenge. It's unclear if he's talking about adults or kids doing this behavior. I'm not sure. But he says that the bullied will persist in this submissive, defensive state long after the threat has passed. And the nearest reference for this is that book on bullying that I can't get my hands on. And I'm not sure how much it talks about adults, so... I have hit my fatigue point with arguing these things this week. I don't like this, but I can't muster up the fucks to really launch a good counter-argument against it. 
I will point out that my script reviewer, editor, slash husband uh, did comment that this seems more like a worn out trope than anything empirical, so... In a drastic change of pace from talking about lobsters, Peterson says that sometimes the bullied are bullied because they can't fight back, like a huge size difference, or sometimes because the bullied won't fight back. He describes temperament differences between the two, no reference, and then talks about people who have decided that all forms of aggression, including feelings of anger, are morally wrong. And again, no citation, of course. Peterson argues that anger and aggression aren't just forces for harm, but they're also able to push back against oppression, speak truth, and motivate resolute movement forward in times of strife, uncertainty, and danger. Something that might be felt by, oh, I don't know, maybe a group of people who are fighting for the same rights as everyone else? To be able to be protected by the law as a group? Be able to use the bathroom that they feel safest in? Stop being killed at a disproportionate rate in this country? Maybe? This is a long quote, but bear with me. If you can bite, you generally don't have to. When skillfully integrated, the ability to respond with aggression and violence decreases rather than increases the probability that actual aggression will become necessary. If you say no early in the cycle of oppression, and you mean what you say, then the scope for oppression on the part of the oppressor will remain properly bounded and limited. The forces of tyranny expand inexorably to fill the space made available for their existence. People who refuse to muster appropriately self-protective territorial responses are laid open to exploitation as much as those who genuinely can't stand up for their own rights because of a more essential inability or a true imbalance in power. I've got some thoughts on this. First, this feels really weird coming from somebody who kinda sorta really stood up in front of his government to say that this targeted group of people who are on the receiving end of an imbalance of power don't get to be a protected class because he's afraid of thought policing. Second, I'm honestly torn. In elementary school, I was tested by bullies. I pushed back. I wasn't bullied. I was also a good asset to keep happy because I made group projects go a lot easier. On the other hand, in middle school, I was on the end of some pretty relentless bullying. My two best friends decided they didn't want to be friends with me anymore and made my life a living hell. And I put up with it because I was convinced that the one friend had convinced the other friend to do it and eventually she would get bored and tired of that other friend and move on to the next and I would be there as a good friend ready to keep going with that one friend and that happened. And I kept going with that one friend and it was great for a couple months until that other friend came back in and it all started over again. And I said, nope, I'm done, I'm out. And so at the next available opportunity, I changed friend groups. So I've stood up and said no to the bullies and it worked and I've been walked all over by bullies. So I'm torn. I think his point in essence, is that people are consenting to be bullied, and I'm torn on that. Looking back at my situation, I can kind of see that argument at play here. I let it happen to me. But if you look at this for more than a second, it's victim blaming. You're telling these kids who are being bullied that it's their fault that they're being bullied. That's fucked up. It's your own damn fault that your face is so punchable and your serotonin levels are so low. Come on, stand up straight with your shoulders back. It'll fix everything. Bullying is a complex problem. And programs that have tried to fix it have had mixed results and not the best success. 
but at least they're trying. He talks about getting his own clients who have resentment to realize that this resentment is actually an indication that they need to say something. If they resist, he contextualizes it for them as holding tyranny at bay and keeping society from getting corrupt. Peterson says the shock that nice people have upon finding out that they've got this anger in their nature and this aggression in their nature is evidenced by the PTSD that soldiers go through for the things they did and not the things that were done to them. Huge citation needed here. My god. If you check out my ethics and psych research video, I talk about the Zimbardo and Milgram experiments. Basically, these experiments demonstrated that normal, happy, healthy, average Americans, when told to, can do some pretty horrific things. It's a capacity that most people have, and the people in these experiments were kind of horrified by what they were capable of doing. So there is research on this, but of course, he doesn't reference it. In an abrupt shift, he says, I have had clients who were terrified into literally years of daily hysterical convulsions by the sheer look of malevolence on their attackers' faces. Such individuals typically come from hyper-sheltered families where nothing terrible is allowed to exist and everything is fairyland wonderful, or else. This comment feels like so much shade. Yes, dealing with hazards and dangerous situations and harm is a normal part of growing up, and yeah, helicopter parents are kind of sort of messing that up for their kids. But how frequently are families these Stepford Wives dystopias where everything has to be sunshine and rainbows or else? I need a reference. Peterson makes the assertion that once people have become aware of and embraced this monster side of themselves, that had possibly been lurking in its shadow archetype, maybe, Peterson, maybe, they gain self-respect, their anxiety and their fear level goes down, and they begin to resist oppression. They see that they have the ability to withstand because they are terrible too. Citation needed. Then he addresses the losers. Literally. He says that if you slouch around like a sad lobster, people are going to treat you as if you're low status and then you can't get the serotonin you need to be a big, strong lobster. And he talks a lot of this correlational stuff as if they're causal, but remember, correlation is not causation. Then he tries to spin the price, Matthew, whatever, people who have get more, people who have less get less, that thing, into something positive by saying that you just need to start getting, and then you'll keep getting. Problem solved. At one point, he actually basically describes the incel versus Chad poster, put an image up, uh, to talk about how posture will impact how people treat you. If your posture is poor, for example, if you slump, shoulders forward and rounded, chest tucked in, head down, looking small, defeated, and ineffectual, then you will feel small, defeated, and ineffectual. He acknowledges that standing up straight with your shoulders back might actually make you a bit of a target, and he literally says, fair enough. And then he counters with, But standing up straight with your shoulders back is not something that's only physical, because you're not only a body, you're a spirit, so to speak, a psyche as well. Standing up physically also implies and invokes and demands standing up metaphysically. Standing up means voluntarily accepting the burden of being. First, how does this actually change the person being a target again because they're a threat now? Second, there is no possible way for this to have any p different interpretation based on your belief structure. Nope, none at all. I am a materialist with some possible concessions for how consciousness works pending research. But basically, we are all physical material stuff. Our brains, our bodies, our mind is based in the physical reality of stuff. If I'm being charitable when reading this, he's saying that the physical act of standing up straight with your shoulders back will also improve your mental state as well. 
But then there's that spirit in there metaphysically standing up. I don't like it. Remember that the burden of being is the knowledge that life is hard. So I guess standing up straight physically and mentally means that knowing that life is hard. And of course, no reference. I'm vaguely familiar with some research showing that being in like power stances, not that you can see this black on black, uh, boosts your self-esteem, but that's not referenced here. Nothing is, of course. And then he talks about fighting dragons for their gold. I think I included in the Jung video, and no, I did somewhere, the part about the hero's journey and going and slaying a dragon and that being a representation of your mom to gain independence from your parents. Basically, dragons, here again, Jung, again. There's a lot of things that standing up straight with your shoulders back means. They include... Accepting the terrible responsibility of life with eyes wide open. Transform chaos's potential into orders, usable, whatever. And again, siding well into the order side of things instead of the middle ground between order and chaos. Realizing that you'll die someday. This one got a what from me. Willingly undertaking the sacrifices necessary to generate a productive and meaningful reality. It means acting to please God in the ancient language. Breaking from the flow we had going here a little bit, but remember from the overture that being is separate from objective reality? I guess that's why he's talking about a meaningful reality here. The pleasing God thing came out of right field, so I don't really have context for why it's here other than as a transition into building Noah's Ark, leading Jews during their exile, speaking the prophetic word to those who would ignore the widows and children, Shouldering the cross that marks the X, where you and being meet. Throwing tyrannical order into the chaos from whence it was born because... Reasons? And then dealing with the uncertainty that you now have because you need to rebuild order because you got rid of it in the tyranny chucking. Chapter wrap up. So, attend carefully to your posture. Quit drooping and hunching around. Speak your mind. Put your desires forward as if you had a right to them. At least the same right as others. Like a person's fucking pronouns, Peterson? He says that if you do this, people will take notice. They will view you as more capable. You will have more conversations. These conversations will somehow be less awkward. You'll meet more people. Good things will come your way. You will be able to work on embracing being with a capital B, so that you will be able to handle the shit that life throws your way. This kind of feels like what I know of the secret, but instead of throwing out positivity and what you want to the universe, you're fixing your posture. Thus emboldened, you will embark on the voyage of your life, let your light shine, so to speak, on the heavenly hill, and pursue your rightful destiny. Then the meaning of your life may be sufficient to keep the corrupting influence of mortal despair at bay. Surface level, with some more self-confidence, you can live your best life. Digging in a little. Voyage of life feels like it could be similar to the hero's journey, but I might need to take the Jung tinfoil hat off at this point, because I think it's cutting off blood flow. Pursuing a rightful destiny. I knew a very religious Christian counseling psychologist who researched people's callings. And part of his research was looking at people's callings and trying to get them into the best fit for that calling. Interesting guy. Lots of stories. I'm guessing the corruption he's talking about here is from the overture. It's an alternative to taking on the burden of being that I didn't include, but I'll include now. The alternative to taking on being is the horror of authoritarian belief, the chaos of the collapsed state, the tragic catastrophe of the unbridled natural world, the existential angst and weakness of the purposeless individual. It's only after you're physically and metaphysically able to stand up straight with your shoulders back that you'll be able to deal with life and be able to find joy. 
Overall, not great, not terrible. But huge complaint with the referencing. It didn't really seem to line up where the references were in relation to what was being talked about. So that was a problem. And also sometimes the references weren't even talking about what they were being cited for, which is a problem. And a little plagiarism, which is a problem. So there's that. Let's revisit the takeaways. Be the mightiest lobster. So we talked about lobsters and wrens and other things just to get the idea across that you need to be assertive. Super. An odd thing with his dominance hierarchies here. These dominance hierarchies aren't always being about the baddest motherfucking lobster who gets to live in lobster mansion and bang all the lobster bitches. It's not always about that. Going back to the chicken pecking order, so remember chicken pyramid, we're there now. The chickens who are the top chickens, like the alpha cock, it's, it's not just free ride. Yes, they get the best food selection and yes, they get the best roosting, but there's also responsibilities on them. They're alpha in part because they know where to find the best food and they're expected to look out for the rest of the flock. They keep an eye out for predators or bad situations so that they can alert the other chickens like, hey, something bad's going to go down. Get your asses out of here. I got this. Get the chickens to safety. They'll be the last one out because they're the best able to deal with whatever the threat is. It's not just about reproduction and eating food. Like, there is a responsibility there and there is a reason why this alpha chicken gets to eat the best and be maintained the best. It's because he's, or she, is keeping the rest of the flock safe. The lower status chickens benefit from the higher status chickens. Two, you will only be bullied if you let them. This is disturbing and oh so comforting to those who have actually been bullied. He's sort of implying here that if you're bullied, you're complacent in it. And I'm not sure how this idea of just being assertive and saying, no, don't do this to me, will help those who've been cyber bullied. I mean, I'm pretty sure we've seen that for people who are cyber bullied, no, don't do this, it's wrong. No matter how assertive, it doesn't help anything. Three, fake strength to get strength. Granted, fake it till you make it is decent advice, especially if you're working on your confidence in a new area or if you're dealing with imposter syndrome and feel like you don't belong. Putting up airs of, oh, I'm fine, I got this, can work. But I feel like that's not fully capturing what Peterson's trying to get at with this chapter. Being all confident and Billy Big Boots isn't quite everything that he's saying. It seems like he's saying that everybody should try to be the Chad or the Stacy, when really that's not in the cards for everybody. And even if it was in the cards for everybody, that's not really success for everyone. We can define success in many different ways. Going back to animal models, the coy cunning cuttlefish, who's a small male, can get in and mate with the female right under the alpha male's nose because he's small and cunning. If this wasn't a viable mating strategy, we wouldn't see it. It would have been selected against years ago. But it's a viable mating strategy in a lot of different species. So it's not always about being the biggest lobster. Finally, if everyone is top lobster, then no one is top lobster. And with that, that's all I've got for this video. So, like if you enjoyed this video, hit me up in the comments. I have had a lot of really good discussions on a lot of videos, so keep that up. Maybe support me on Patreon, maybe? Oh yeah, and I've got a Twitter and an Instagram. Links are at the end of the video. And 
We'll see next week if I do rule two, which is treat yourself how you would treat others, or if I switch it up because the style of madness is starting to eat at my brain. We'll see. Call it a surprise. Uh, so, see you next week. Bye.